edition of the Two Fit Podcast. And if you're listening to this podcast, you know by now that we're always trying to push the level of human performance in pretty much every area of life. And our guest today, that's what he does day in and day out. And uh, that is Andy Galpin. And we're really honored to have him on the show because he leads a lot of really cool research at Cal State Fullerton uh, in the Center for Sports Performance and has a background in athletics and training, has his PhD, and uh, he's doing a lot of really cool things. Andy, welcome to the show. Honored to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so just starting out, Andy, I know myself and Josh, we've read a lot of your work, but what led you down this path, you know, personally into, you know, human performance and, and uh, you know, peak human performance? Yep, sure. You know, a couple of things. What kind of got me in the field in general is, is honestly about the same thing that got a lot of us scientists in it, is that I was a good enough athlete to be excited and enticed to continue pursuing athletics, but I wasn't good enough to be really good. <laughs> You know, so it's like I needed every possible advantage to continue playing and to stay on the field. Um, and so there was enough of a carrot where I said, like, yeah, I keep doing this, and I can see noticeable changes. But I wasn't so good where I'm like, ah, this doesn't matter. And so early on, I just got really excited about being like, how can I optimize? How can I stay on the field and keep playing? And that just that got caught a fire in me, man. And I just continued on from there. And then what I started to realize is, as I was going through as my undergraduate and my doctorate work and everything else, it's like, hey, we do a lot of research on normal people and on sick people. But, but if we're really trying to improve health, are we really trying to get better or are we trying to just get above that line of sick? Mm. Well, we don't even know what we're shooting for. How do we know what the gold standard is if we never test the gold standard? If we don't push the limit, where do we know, how do we know what the limit is? And so both philosophically as well as scientifically, it just started making sense to me to say, look, why don't we actually start studying the elite people so we can make better recommendations about what normal is. So, for example, there's a difference between normal and average, right? We tend to think those, we tend to think those are the same thing, but just because the average person is like that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's supposed to be normal. That's true. Right, and so for me, it's just trying to highlight that, and, and that's just kind of my motivation. So you really subscribe to the, what I'm gathering is kind of the minimum effective dose strategy. No, actually the opposite. Yeah. So the opposite. I think that the minimum effective dose is tremendously good for hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. But what I want to see is what is the, where, where do you start losing the game? So you got to put in 90% more to get 1% more. Because if we know where the far end of the spectrum is, now we've got a complete answer from the furthest down the line of sickness and health to what's, what is it like if I put in 150 miles of running a week? Right. What is it like if I squat every single day? Because if I know that, then we can tease back and say, okay, we think you can actually do a lot more than what we've been telling you. We, the recommendations are three days a week, 30 minutes, but when we see people succeeding way out here or breaking, but at least we can dial back in. So I think minimum effective dose is, is really, really, really important, and that's what you need to make change in people but I want to know where the farthest end of the spectrum is. And so I want to go the opposite. What's it look like when people are getting after it, training three times a week, and do they really break? And if they don't, why? And if they do, why? So I'm on the other end of the spectrum. Now, is that kind of, it sounds like you're referencing, you take the guy that's already incredibly strong who can squat, let's say, 700 pounds, and he's trying to squat 720 pounds. Right. So trying to add that little bit, you know, or the golfer that averages 70.3 and he's trying to average 69 and a half. Exactly. Because that, I mean, that's where, if, if you look at both physiology as well as skill adaptation, you know, I, I play a lot of golf too. So I can tell you right now, it takes nothing for me to go from 100 to a 92. I mean, that's a couple of weeks. I've probably one session with a decent swing coach and I could go from 100 to 92. And so like, what does that really tell me about physiology? What's that really tell me about uh, pedagogy? What's it tell me about coaching? Not a lot, because that's a minimal effect of those. That's one really important thing that made a big change. Well, that's great to get most people to not be embarrassing on a course. Right? Let's get most people to move pretty well. But what, what do we actually need? What separates effective training, nutrition, coaching, lifestyle, is how do we take somebody from that 90th to 93rd percentile? That's when things matter. And the, the, the exercise example would be something like this. If you took somebody who's, let's say you're 35 years old, you know, I played sports in high school, but I really haven't been working out since then. And that's, that's about every, most 35-year-olds, right? Um, my knee's still bugging me. That old high school injury kind of crept back into me. 
The dad well, bod. You, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> dad bod. You take that person and you put them on basically any diet, any training program. They're going to gain muscle, get faster, lose fat, be in better shape, and be stronger. And so you're like, I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not saying those are unimportant. I hope you don't feel like I'm downplaying those. But what I'm saying is sort of like, eh, yeah, it all works. It's not super important. As long as you stick with it, basically. Compliance is the biggest issue, right? Exactly. Compliance and adherence. Are you doing it? Are you working hard, being patient? Are you doing basically the right things and not just doing something completely off the, the charts? Then you're probably going to get your goals if you stay patient enough. So don't come to me after six weeks. Come after six months, two years, three years. They're all going to work. Pick your favorite diet. Pick your favorite program you pay for. They're all going to work. But what works once you get past that? Now I'm two, three years in. I've been working hard, and all of a sudden my gains have stopped. I can't lose that last 10 pounds. I'm trying to shave that last stroke off. Now what you're doing really, really, really starts to matter. And so what we want to figure out is, okay, where is that physiological line of getting that last adaptation and training too much, working too hard, right? Uh, is it a physical limitation or is it just simply to say I'm not moving correctly? So my muscle's not breaking down because of, the, of how much I'm lifting or how hard I'm training. Maybe it's because I'm not moving perfectly. I'm moving good, moving well, but not perfectly. So that, that's just sort of it. And then for me, so what we, what we do at Fullerton is, you know, we take the muscle biopsy out of folks. And we're studying these athletes with these types of training programs at that single cell level. So all the way down to those tiny organelle at the myonuclei, the mitochondria. And what we're trying to identify are, are basic questions along the line of, okay, number one, why is it they are different than the rest of us? Why is it they recover different? And even things like, we all heard this one, right? Well, it's genetics. They were born that way. Well, it's clearly a component, but so is their training. And so now the question is, well, how much exactly is each? Is it 10% training? Is it 80% training? Because we know both play into the account. Right. And we're actually starting to get some numbers on some of these things. And uh, perhaps if you're nice, I can tell you some of the initial <laughs> findings. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I did want to know kind of through all of your research and your You've been, you know, published. I saw you have over like 47 publications on the website and 170 something articles. So right. All this research. What are some things that you have found that have really wowed you and stick it out in your mind? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever asked me that one. So, bang, yeah. bang up job. <laughs> <laughs> Something already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not. No. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of things that really stand out to me. Um, number one is. I actually give you kind of a high, quick highlight of three of them. Uh, one of them I'll keep very short, which is we've actually recently started to take biopsies of elite level mixed martial artists. So these are very highly ranked UFC fighters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So folks in the UFC, you'd know their name, you'd know their face. You know, I'm not going to say it, but. Sure. Um, and what we're seeing is we know that they're bigger than most people, stronger, have better conditioning. Like that's all pretty well understood. But what we're seeing from them, which is really crazy, is without getting too detailed, but the basic structure, their basic physiology at their cellular level is just different than ours. And it's, it's different beyond a training adaptation and it's different beyond all the, they're on steroids. Um, so those things we're able to tease out and those are not accounting for it. So it's, it's something unique and, and interesting that that's got us really excited right now to do this, uh, some upcoming projects where we're like, Hey, we need to really get after this field because we think that we can find new things about physiology by studying these folks. I think I just posted something uh, this week or last week on my Instagram. A new paper came out about studying elite athletes that found that, that their mitochondria, which is the part of your cell that, that makes all of your aerobic metabolism. So we know that uh, endurance athletes or aerobic athletes have more of these mitochondria and their mitochondria are bigger but what found, this new paper found out for the first time is even independent of that, their mitochondria are about 25% more efficient, wow. which is crazy. And so what people tend to tell you numbers like you can't have this or this organelle do this or this body part does this. Well, what we're basically saying now is it does in normal people, but it's possible to be out here. The question then is, okay, why is it possible to be out there and why is no one out there? And it's only because of two reasons. One, because we're not studying that population, so perhaps that's more prevalent than we think. Or two, 
It's because they're actually doing the right things. They're actually training that hard. Maybe we're supposed to train that hard. Maybe we could all have that if we trained that hard. So that, that's just kind of one, and I kind of wrapped in three or four different studies to kind of highlight that idea. But that's one of the ones that really recently has got us uh, really excited. And, uh, and I'll, make it, I'll give you a more tangible number um, to wrap this thing up. I got to be a part of a study several years ago where he biopsied a world record holder uh, sprinter. So this guy has a world record in 110-meter uh, hurdles, I think. And the way that your muscle works is most people have heard of quick twitch muscle fibers, fast twitch, right? Right, so you got fast twitch and you have slow twitch. Well, there's this third subcategory that are kind of like your mega fast, ultra fast twitch, but we never find them in humans. So less than one out of 1,000, so this 0.01% of, of your muscle is this, this 2X fiber. Right, so it just, it doesn't exist. We don't find it anywhere. Well, to my knowledge, this is the only high elite level speed athlete that's ever been biopsied and, and reported. And if you think about it, what does the word quick twitch or fast twitch refer to? Like contraction speed, right? Right. And so it's interesting that, like, wait a minute, we have all these uh, conclusions about fast twitch and slow twitch, but yet we've actually never studied the muscle of a fast athlete. So this gentleman was biopsied, and he had about 24% of his muscle being a 2X. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Which is about 23.9% higher than anything we've ever seen. <laughs> And is it determined yet that it's kind of the, we were talking about this a while back, is the chicken and the egg argument. Was he yeah. born that way or was he developed from a young age through training that way? Is there any- well, Here's the interesting thing is anyone that we have ever found that does have those two X fibers, they go away as soon as you start training. Hmm. So I, I don't know. I can't promise you anything because we would have had to biopsy him when he was 10 years old or something to know for sure. But what we do know is if you have them, they tend to go away with training. So it's very, very, very unlikely he trained into that. Um, but what we do have is a really interesting so model. could have actually had higher levels. Could have. Yeah. So is there a reason why they go away with training? Well, we, we don't know necessarily because we don't really understand their true function. Because we can't ever find them to study them. So I, I don't really know. But what the thought is is that your fibers... So this is another thing people don't understand. Your fibers generally convert to slow twitch or to fast twitch. So your slow twitch fibers transform into becoming a fast twitch fiber when you're about to die or when the fiber is about to die. So it's possible, or in general people, what we think happen is if you have a 2X, that means you're probably pretty untrained, which means it's about to die. And then you start working it out and it, and it kind of like brings it back to life. And it says, oh shit, you need me. Okay. And then it gets turned back into a normal functioning fiber. Mm -hmm. um, there are some evolutionary guesses as to why that happens. It, it's, it's, I'll be honest, it is a complete guess and could be totally wrong. But the basic thought would be something like, well, if you are in the wild, uh, if you convert to these super fast fibers, at least you have enough speed and power to run two or three, four or five steps away from a predator. So at least you could survive until you were recovered or something like that. But I mean, that's, that's just beyond a guess. So. Yeah, I mean, it's just really interesting. And when we find, when we study these people, we just, we just see new things about all of physiology about them. So it's not just about knowing how to make your 700-pound squat 710. But it's really showing us new insights about how physiology works and what we're humanly capable of. And since you brought up the type 1 and type 2, the fast twitch, slow twitch fibers, I know that that's, that's always a common question is how, you know, because we are born, correct me if I'm wrong, with, certain people have different amounts of type two and type one fibers. Mm -hmm. So how can people train to have more fast twitch fibers? What have been some effective training methods you've seen for that result? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, a couple of things on that. Number one, you can go in both directions. So we're, we, you're correct. We are all born with different amounts of fast to slow, but that's extremely plastic. So you can change, you can add more slow or you can add more fast. And that, is determined by a bunch of things, but most directly your training. And so what can you do to actually give yourself more fast twitch fibers? I'm going to break your heart a little bit here. Anything fast or heavy. Whoa, groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> right? Can we sell that as an ebook? Get that thing out there? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't appear to matter that 
that tremendous that that much. So you do something that requires those fibers to be faster and stronger and bigger, you're probably gonna shift more in that direction. And are actually you just, are you just adding are you just adding more of those types of fibers or are these ones actually transforming into into two? Okay. okay. So what do you want the real answer or you want the scientifically on supported answer? <laughs> Give me the real stuff. Um so I'll answer, I'll give you the real or the, the scientific answer first, and then we'll get a little bit crazy. Okay. <laughs> so we don't typically think that you add new muscle fibers. So what would happen is you would have an existing fiber that was a slow twitch. It would convert itself into becoming a fast twitch. All right, that's okay. what's happened. Now the idea that you alluded to is called hyperplasia, which is this concept that you can add new muscle fibers. Right. So traditionally, we will tell people that that doesn't happen in normal humans, but normal situations. It happens in other mammals. We can't find on humans. Uh, I've said this since, since I was like an undergrad and I'll say this till I die. And it's, it's sort of like my pseudo career mission is to prove <laughs> that it actually does happen because <laughs> I'm fully convinced that it does happen. I think in fact, I just shared this with a friend of mine. It's, it was like 99% joke, but we had our laser microscope going so we can look at individual muscle cells in three dimensions and we can fluoresce and like tag them. And we saw one that was clearly one cell and as we got to the end of the fiber, it was splitting into two. Wow. Now, like 99% likely, that just means we damaged it with our needle or something on accident. <laughs> but I'm like, dude, see, I told you. I told you, bro, like it's happening. Right. Like, Shut up. <laughs> but yeah, I'm convinced, man. What would happen there is you would have, you know, say you had, these numbers are way smaller, but say you had 10 fibers in your, in your bicep. And sure. your entire bicep was made of 10 individual fibers. It would go through basic what we were taught in, in middle school or, or kindergarten or whatever about meiosis and mitosis, right? Where a cell divides into two, that's literally what would happen. So the cell would, would replicate its DNA into two, the chromosomes would split, it would split in half, and then you would have two fibers in the place of one. That would be an exact replica of the first one. Hmm. So I think it absolutely happens. Uh, we have some evidence from a, a group in Scandinavia that looked at bodybuilders. And what's interesting is, if you look at the individual fibers of a bodybuilder, do you think they're bigger or smaller than most people? The way you asked that question, I'm gonna say smaller. Yeah, <laughs> by the way, I asked it, right? <laughs> yeah. But you, you would think the answer would be other fibers right. must be huge. Mm -hmm. The UFC fibers I mentioned, their fibers are tiny. Bodybuilders' fibers are tiny. And so how is it possible their fibers are small but their absolute muscle, their entire leg is huge. They have to have more total fibers. Right. So again, that doesn't answer your question earlier, Josh, about was that, well, were they maybe born with more fibers? That's why they were good at bodybuilding? Well, we don't know, and this is the problem, we'll have a hard time answering this question, is the only way we would know is if we biopsy them when they were a kid, and then, but we can't do that, it's not legal. So we have some models that we're working on right now, we think we can show it, which is, monozygous twins and we've got a really cool study where we took in monozygous twins and, and those are identical twins so that means they're that one sperm went into one egg that egg split into two and then you had two brothers so that are literally dna replications of each other right, these are opposed to normal twins which is just two eggs that were fertilized and so you're just like a brother or, si or a sister that's why you could have a male and a female or something in that case but with identical those are the ones that look exactly like because they're the same they're a clone they're quite literally a clone well, we found a bunch of people that are like that, and the, one of the brothers has been training their whole life and one hasn't. Mm -hmm. Things like that. So now we have, we know by, based on your brother what your DNA said, and we know based on your other brother what the training did. And our initial stuff has showed that the ability you have to change with training is much, much higher than we previously thought. Yeah, it sounds like you found a gold mine in those two. <laughs> yeah, we've actually found, found several of them now. So I think for some people here in the bodybuilding, um, you know, analogy example, they're probably wondering, okay, well, if I'm not, let's say that scientifically, I'm not adding new fibers. How are they so big? How do they continue to grow? How do, how do, how do any of us build mass? Yeah. So you have this really interesting thing where you, you've got a big muscle. I can pick your favorite one. Your, your delt, your tri, who cares? You have one muscle fiber or one muscle, one muscle. Sorry. Inside that muscle, you've got millions of individual muscle fibers. It's kind of like a ponytail. So if a ponytail was one muscle, all of your individual hairs would be their own cell. So what happens is 
the diameter or the size, the cross-sectional area of each fiber gets thicker. It expands. And you can continue to expand that as big or as large as you want until you lose control of the cell itself. And what I mean by that is, you know, just picture or imagine uh, you're running a business and you decide you want to, you have your central branch in West Virginia and you want to expand to Florida. And then you want to expand to uh, uh, Kansas and you want to expand to Wyoming. Well, you're probably going to put a, uh, a manager in each one of those branches as you expand. That way, if like a printer breaks in Texas, the manager can just handle that. But if there's not a manager there and you're on, like this just is a huge pain in the ass to handle that increased size. Well, those managers in your fibers are called the nuclei. So that's what holds your DNA and it controls transcription, translation, ribosome development, you know, for protein synthesis, all that stuff. And so what I'm saying here is your fibers will continue to expand in diameter as long as you have enough myonuclei to control that, that area. Once your fiber starts to say, hey, you're asking each one of us nuclei to control too big of a region. You want me to control California, Utah, Arizona, Texas, like I can't do this much. Then you won't be, level, you won't be allowed to continue to expand. So that's really what it's limited by. So some people would argue that your, the amount of hypertrophy you have is only limited by that myonuclear domain. So how much of a domain each nuclei has to control. Those nuclei, you can add nuclei to your cell, and that's exactly what satellite cells do. So a satellite cell will come in, and it will differentiate, turn into a nucleus, and you can continue to expand. And one of the cool things, or not cool things, depending on your perspective, is that we know exogenous testosterone use. In other words, you know, steroids, or right. well, other steroids can increase that satellite cell accretion and can increase your mononuclear number. So well, that's one of the many, many, many reasons why that is so effective at adding muscle mass, testosterone specifically. And it also brings out another ethical question. So for example, pick your sport, but I fail a testosterone test. Or some of the sports that say that allow testosterone exemptions. So you can legally take your hormone replacement therapy, right? Right. Cool. So you take it for six months or something, or you fail the test and you're banned for six months, but guess what? Those myonuclei are in the muscle for life. Wow, it's good to know. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if it's there for life, but we know it's there for a very, very long time. A year, right. two, three, four, five years. Depends on how long you took the testosterone, how much you took, all that stuff, but it's, it's an interesting question. It reminds me of uh, kind of what you're getting at here is what, what the old football coaches used to tell you. You know, mass moves mass, basically. If you want to yeah. be stronger, you just got to eat everything in sight and, you know, put on the pounds, and you're going to be able to move more, which yeah. obviously we know isn't true because there's some, you know, 300-pound linemen that you'd be stronger than in the weight room, correct? Yeah. So how can people add that strength without having to put on that mass? So, yeah, if, boy, timely question. Literally, probably as we're speaking right now, my students are answering that exact question on their exam. Wow. Like that literally on the exam today. It's a two-part question. Number one, true or false? And since we're in class right now, you're going to have to answer it. <laughs> it's flipping the script on us. Yeah. yeah. True or false, you can add strength without adding mass. Can you get stronger without, getting, without adding any more muscle mass? Is it physically possible at all? True. Yeah, it has to be, right? That's how we can continue to break records in weight class sports. Right. right. I can get stronger, and that's exactly, Jake, what you just brought up, right? Right. Like, all right, I can be stronger than this person. Just because they're bigger doesn't mean they're going to be stronger than me. Okay, the opposite of that, true or false, is it possible to add muscle mass and not get stronger? False. Nailed yeah, the two for two, right? <laughs> Now, in my class, I get you one point out of 20. The other 19 points come. Explain to me how that's possible. Oh, gosh. That's why we got you, Andy. <laughs> I mean, I would get into on the strength aspect, the tensile strength of the muscle fibers has to increase with load. Sure. You got a bunch of things. So Central strength, nervous system. Exactly. That's another one, right? You have improvements in the nervous system. Uh, the, exactly. The contractile function of the individual fiber can improve. That's independent. The neural pathway. 
exactly. All those stuff. And you got, and most people are actually fair. That's what people talk about whenever you hear people talk about the old central nervous system or this is central or central fatiguing. They're referring to the brain, brain stem, spinal cord, and the nervous system. And that's totally true. Right? But the inverse question is the one that's interesting, which is why is it you can't put on muscle mass without getting at least a little bit stronger? Now, that's not to say, and back to your question, Jake, that's not to say adding muscle mass is the optimal strength training program. Clearly, that's not the case. If that was, bodybuilders would be stronger than powerlifters, weightlifters, world's strongest men. It's not. Right. That doesn't mean, or that what that does mean is you will never see a 300-pound bodybuilder that's 8% body fat that's weak. It, it, it can't be. There's too much. I mean, I mean, like, the, like my childhood, Google Ronnie Coleman training videos, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like everyone knows that. I think we've all heard that too. That kind of myth, like, Oh, they're not strong. And you look over and he's benching three fifteen for 20 reps. You know, I'm pretty sure. That's guys... a warm up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like those dudes are leg pressing two two grand. Like that's, yeah. you're not weak yeah. and they're squatting 600 like for rep. Yeah. They're, they're super strong. They're not optimally strong, but they're certainly very, very, very strong. So what happens is if we understand what muscle hypertrophy is, I told you those cells get thicker. Right. Well, the reason they get thicker is because you've got these little, what are called contractile proteins. Right? These are the, the it kind of works like a swinging gate. One week reaches up and grabs one and pulls it closer to itself. Okay, where you add proteins to those, so each one of those gates gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And so the cell starts to say, hey, I'm kind of cramped. Let me increase my diameter so that each of your gates can have the same ratio. One doesn't smack into the next one. Okay, so what that means is if you've hypertrophied, you have added those contractile proteins and you have more contractile proteins, you're going to make more of those interactions. You're going to produce more force, but you didn't necessarily optimize the neural adaptations or you didn't optimize the connective tissue adaptations. So that's why you didn't optimize your strength. Right? You got stronger, but you didn't, you didn't get perfectly stronger like you would if you're trying to be in a weight, uh, bodybuilder weight or uh, be a powerlifter, weight, weightlifter, etc. So let's talk training adaptation or let's talk training prescription for that. What we typically see happen is with strength, you basically need to do one thing. And I'm oversimplifying, so if you're a super power lifter, you're gonna get really pissed off and send me hate mail, but I don't, yeah. you get the idea. To be stronger, you have to lift something up that's heavy. Push something, pull something, twist something that's heavy. And it really isn't more complicated than that. Speed helps as well. So move things fast, move things heavy. That's not a tremendous stimulus for hypertrophy. And so this is why you can see people, I mean, pick your favorite weightlifter, continue to get stronger or break world records in, without going into the next weight class above. So what this typically means is very low volume. So less than probably five or so repetitions per set. And whatever is heavy for you, 80% of your one run max, 90%, maybe higher, something like that. Uh, you're not going to do a tremendous amount of total sets of that either and then your speed work and then not eating a massive caloric surplus if you do those things you're going to put on a little bit of mass over time but not a tremendous amount so if you focus on the other end of the training spectrum more on speed more on power and more on low volume strength training that's going to get you strong without a ton of mass the other end of the spectrum is if we look at what it causes hypertrophy there's three mechanisms that are needed to cause your muscles to go through hypertrophy. You don't have to have all three. You have to have at least one of the three, and a really good program will have two. All right, that's gonna get you in a really good spot. So mechanism number one is it has to overcome some sort of tension, which is a fancy way of saying some shit had to be heavy. <laughs> right, boom. Again, look at Ronnie Coleman, they're moving big weights. That stuff is heavy. It's not as heavy as a, you know, somebody squatting on the left side, but it's still heavy. So there has to be some sort of strain of mechanical tension. Number two, there has to be some sort of muscular damage. Okay, now you don't have to be sore to get hypertrophy and just because you went like mega sore doesn't mean you grow anymore. But the type of workouts that tend to make you sore also tend to make you add muscle mass. So this would be, again, things that are in the moderate rep range, 6 to 8 to 12 to 15 reps, that kind of heavy, 60, 70, 80, 90% for three, four, five sets, three or four exercises. I mean, your very standard hypertrophy training prescription is probably going to make you sore. In addition, you can do things like eccentric training, heavy negatives, 
That'll make you super sore. It's a lot of force production. It could even be isometric stuff, depending on the movement, right? You go down, do a front squat, hold it at the bottom for 10 seconds. You're going to get sore, yeah. right? Yeah, some doms coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo, right? So you've got number one was heavy. Number two was something that might induce a little bit of muscle damage. And number three is called metabolic strain. Metabolic strain is, that's the pump, right? Like that's the burn, things like that. So all three of those are, are important for muscle hypertrophy. If you can get a program that gets all three of them in, you're going to really, you're going to maximize hypertrophy. Now the pump can be even up to say 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 reps maybe. And you could go away that that's still going to put you in a hypertrophy zone, right? But now, of course, now it has to be lighter, maybe 50% of your one rep max, something like that. Maybe you do one set of 40. I mean, I don't know, something like that. Maybe you do two rounds of that. Maybe you do really short rest intervals, so you only take 30 seconds in between rounds. So my point is, there's not one magical recipe for hypertrophy. In fact, if you look at even like a power lifter, uh, I saw, um, um, oh gosh, oh, what's his name? Matt, uh, Matt, oh, they totally dropped. We just met, recently. anyways, sorry. Uh, very famous power lifter, and he's, Recently, he's been posting nothing but a bunch of stuff on Instagram about doing sets of 30 or set of 100 of tricep extensions. Wow. Right? And he's, you know, he's a power lifter. And he, like, he's doing a set of 100. Well, he's trying to really build up his triceps right now. And he's doing, like, literally tricep pushdowns, which is, like, the most anti-powerlifting movement ever, right? And he's doing super light for a set of 100, set of 40. Right? Because he's really saying, hey, look, I'm already handling the mechanical tension part in my heavy lifting. He's probably not getting a tremendous amount of DOMS. But that's because he, he has a big volume already, so he's going to be careful. So he's going really light and getting a pump in there. And that can feel good, too. And so now really to answer your question finally, Jake, we understand what training for strength looks like. We understand what training for hypertrophy looks like. So how do I make sure I train for strength and not hypertrophy? Spend most of your time doing those heavy, fast things. And then just be cautious. Am I getting really, really, really sore? Okay, that might be starting to hedge my best towards hypertrophy. Am I also getting a pump? Oh, and it's heavy? Okay, now that's where those, you're going to start building on bulk that you don't want. Mm. Right. And what does the training frequency look like, in your opinion? For? Um, strength and hypertrophy, you know, some. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Um, what, what most of the current data is showing is that even for hypertrophy, more frequent on a muscle group is better. Okay, so the whole idea, like I'll do biceps today, triceps tomorrow, hamstrings Wednesday, shoulders, and what ends up happening there is you only get one day a week for a body part, or even like one body part, it gets trained once every 10 days or something. Right. That can be effective, but what's looking like now is two to three times a week per muscle group is more effective for even hypertrophy. But that, but the, the, but like that's what the caveat, right? Number one, if you train on Monday your chest and you go to train Wednesday again and you can't lift your arms still because you're so sore in your chest, well, you did too much on Wednesday or Monday. That's when you went too far down that damage spectrum. And so I actually think training a muscle group twice or three times or so a week is a pretty good indicator to keep you from either going way too heavy or way too much or way too much volume because you've got to be able to train again a couple of days later. So it may look like just one key exercise per body part instead of two or three. On that yeah, body, it, three yeah it just depends. Some of us can handle, not me, um, but some people can handle two or three exercises per muscle group, two or three days a week. Some of us maybe only do one major movement per muscle group and then maybe like one assistance or, or auxiliary in that muscle group. And then that would get you effectively six exercises in a week on that muscle group if you did it three days a week. Right. Some people can do that. Now with strength, though, you have an entirely different thing because real true strength training or speed or power training, it shouldn't make you that sore. I mean, it will, like, especially in a can. A really, really heavy squat and deadlift can make you sore. But it won't make you as sore often. So you can do strength training far more often for the benefit of strength or especially power or speed. You could do those four or five times a week. If the volume's low and if you're not super sore and you're feeling good and your position's good, your movement's, uh, you're moving well and all those things, 
you can really push the pace on frequency strength training. Again, if you, even if you look at Louis Simmons and his powerlifters, right, that's what they're doing. They're staying as heavy as possible every single time, but they're making a slight change in variation of the, the way they squat or the stance they use or the position. And they choke, you can actually train really heavy, really frequently, if you make a slight change in variation of your movement, change your grip a little bit, change your foot position a little bit, change the bar you use, and you can actually get away with that for, for quite some time. I have a question going back to the strength aspect. So we know that there's not a lot of mass being added in these power lifters that want to maintain the weight class. Mm -hmm. So I might be all over the place here because it's, it's just, it's been kind of rattling around in my mind. Jake and I have talked about it a few times. So is it more of a muscle adaptation or a neural pathway CNS adaptation that's happening to see these strength increases? Because for instance, like we had a, a young man at our CrossFit gym who was seeing massive gains in a very rapid time from snatching 135 pounds up to 285 pounds in less than a year, about a year. I'll and, buy that program. And, yeah, yeah. And he sold weighed a buck 60 you know soaking wet um and really never put on any size a little bit but mm -hmm. what's happening there and how does that also tie into you take a guy that maybe never goes to the gym let's say that his raw deadlift max at that point in time in his life is 200 pounds mm -hmm. he goes and picks up a car off the ground of a lady on the side yep. of the road Yep. What's happening there in those type of strength scenarios if the muscle is not getting larger? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things with your your one athlete. You know, how do I double my snatch in, in six months or something like that? What's probably happening there is a combination with that exact example. The snatch is such a technical movement. A lot of that increase is probably increasing technical efficiency. So simply him getting a better feel for his timing and, and his position. Now, if you took an exercise like a deadlift and you saw those same results, that would be more physiology-based because a deadlift is far lower down the skill spectrum than a snatch. Okay, so that, that aside, let's talk physiology because that, that's a big part of your exact scenario is that's just a really – he just was picking up the technique. That probably took him the first 50 pounds. If we look at what produces force in the body, it's a combination of three things. It starts with the central nervous system. Then the muscle itself has to contract, and then the muscle has to pull on connective tissue. So if you go back to our ponytail analogy, all of those individual cells are wrapped with connective tissue. This is your fascia, right? Everyone talks about fascia, connective tissue. Well, that all comes together into a super fascia, and that, all that super fascia comes together and forms what we call a tendon, right? That's what your tendons are. The tendon then inserts onto the bone. And so muscle actually doesn't move you at all. Connective tissue moves you. But muscle moves connective tissue, and then the connective tissue pulls the bone, and the bone then moves. So the central nervous system tells you the signal. Muscle produces the force, and then connective tissue transmits the force into movement. And so a lot of folks will just give the, all the credit to the nervous system, and things like that. Wow, he's just neurological. Those are all neurological. And in one respect, Okay, whatever, who cares? But technically, that, that, that's one of those little things that inside me as a scientist like, drives me bonkers and makes my blood boil. So I'm like, if I swear to God, if I hear one more coach talk about neural adaptations, I'm gonna throw them out the window. <laughs> yeah, there are some neural adaptations, but that has eliminated the last two, and I would argue more important steps, which is the muscle producing force and the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. So we have a bunch of different things. Yes, there are, there are a ton of neurological adaptations, but as you mentioned earlier, Josh, the actual muscle fibers can change fiber type. They can improve what we call their contractility. And we have a bunch of mechanisms that we've already identified that are happening. But what I mean by that is the fiber itself can produce more force or more power or contract at a faster velocity without being any bigger at all. It can simply get more efficient in the way that it does that swinging gate thing. I mentioned earlier, it just gets more efficient. It produces more force and it does it faster. So what that means is if I literally take that fiber, I take it out of your leg, I cut the nerve, I cut the connective tissue, I tie one end to a force transducer, the other end to a pole. This is what we do in our lab, by the way. And I give you energy, effectively, I give you the nutrients you need, sugar and stuff like that. It will contract and pull that pole harder. 
So it's not a neural issue. It is a muscle actually being physically capable of producing more force. Then we have to start talking about how it articulates with the connective tissue and how that moves the bone. So a couple of things can happen there. Your muscles lay at certain angles relative to your bone. All right, good example of that. Look at your deltoid, your shoulder muscle. That actually runs pretty parallel to the ground. So it runs, if your arm is, if you're standing upright and your arm's hanging down to your side, the muscle looks like it runs from your elbow to the top of your shoulder. It goes up and down, vertical. But your pec at the same time runs horizontal. Okay, well, what can happen is those fibers, the angle at which they're laying will start to shift to improve mechanical efficiency. Hmm. That's called pination angle. So the fiber didn't get any bigger. This is not a neural adaptation, but the way the muscle is oriented to, it's this is biomechanics, this is physics. So there's sort of a win or a loss here. When you gain mechanical efficiency, you gain force, but you lose speed and you lose range of motion. One quick caveat, I'm definitely not saying strength training makes you lose flexibility. Like, not saying that at all. all right, we're talking physics here. Okay. Right. So what we're just saying, though, is that can cause a massive change in the mechanical advantage you have. It changes your fulcrum. It basically can make you into a more effective wheelbarrow or not. Right? This is what we're looking at. And then we haven't even really talked about the connective tissue, right? And I'm not going to just in the sake of time, but you get the idea. Similar changes happen in the connective tissue in where it becomes, we'll say, more elastic. It transfers force more effectively to the bone. And so while you're stronger, while you continue to get stronger without getting any bigger, is a combination of all of that and even more. But that's quickly what's happening. And that's just a continual rep, it's a continual process through repetition. Yeah. Your muscle, put this way, your nervous system adapts really, really quickly. A week, two weeks, right? Less than that, a couple of days probably. Yeah, hell, you take enough reps in practice today, you know, your, your nervous system's kind of changed by the end of it. Muscle responds very, 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 very quickly as well, probably within a couple of days or weeks, even within seconds, depending on how. But it's probably a little bit slower than the nervous system, generally. And the connected tissue is even slowest yet. You know, so this is why people traditionally say, hey, the first two, three weeks, maybe the first 10 or 12 weeks, those adaptations are mostly neural. And then the muscle adaptations come. And then after a couple of years is when you see the connective tissue adaptations really setting in. So how can I, because I, I hear about, I remember hearing back in the day about these strong men who would go in and basically train just the strength of their connective tissue. And apparently they do some, some really grueling workout sessions. And then, you know, they'd have to wait a week or 10 days before they could get back in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? What's, what's going on there? And can people actually train to, you know, build that connected tissue? Or like you're saying, it's just repetitive over time. And eventually with enough training and adaptation, and everything else, you're eventually going to get there. Um, this is a classic example of the science being pretty far behind the coaching. Okay. So number one, I fully believe them that that was an effective training program. Fully. Yeah. What I can tell you though is we have no scientific explanation of what or what that's not doing. Yeah. So I can I can tell you in good faith that that program is not scientifically proven to be specific to the connective tissue, but that's not because it's not doing it. It's because we haven't studied it yet. I got you. Does that make sense? Yeah. It is very very difficult to devise a training program that's independent of any of those three things. So you can't really train the nervous system without training the connective tissue. Right. You can't train the connective tissue and then not be working the muscle because it all works together to make movement. So it's one of those things where they're, they're probably knowing it or not, like they're doing this program and they're, they feel like, oh man, this makes my joints feel better. And then they try to derive like a physiological explanation for it. Mm. And it's sort of like, okay, that's, that's probably not really what's happening, but you are on to a good point. This is a good training program. You know, yeah, I just didn't know what, I can't remember what those training programs even look like. I just remember in my head, I'm thinking these guys are going in there and they're just tearing like the, the tendons, leaving this kind of off the bone a little bit, you know, giving it time. Yeah, what's probably honestly happening is kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, which is they have a variety in their training, which is good. So they're, they're addressing all ends of the spectrum. Connective tissue at this point does appear to respond better to a little bit lower intensity, higher volume. Hmm. Okay. And so this is why if you're like, if I only did one rep maxes all the time, if I never did any sets of ever more than two repetitions, your muscle might 
kind of get move past the point of your connective tissue because here's the problem there's no blood flow really to your connective tissue right so okay you got to either do something a little bit different or you have to do the things that just get a lot of blood in that area to try to get a tiny bit of blood flow into that system so that's about all I can tell you. Uh, and so I'd say the reason why it probably was helpful for them is because it gave them a stimulus that they weren't normally getting. They're probably mostly doing strength stuff. And then they pushed themselves down that metabolic spectrum and got more blood flow in and trained the system a little bit differently. And it responded to that as well. Now, how often do you see guys, is it able, are they able to basically out train that connective tissue and yeah. it could lead to, to, could lead to injury? Most definitely. That's just, this is what happens when you progress too quickly. Mm hmm so this is why a good coach will tell you things like, just because you're able doesn't mean you should. Right. So you got your guy going, okay, I went, you know, started at 130 pounds, then I got to 150, then I got to 180, then I got to two. Well, you probably shouldn't continue to ride that train. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, you know what? Let's spend a month at 200. Oh, 200 is easy. Good. Let's spend two months there then. Oh, it's super easy. Good. Let's spend three months. Like, okay, great. Because your muscles there, the neural systems there, techniques there, but maybe the connective tissue is lagging behind. So maybe it's fine now. But then when you get to 250, it just crushes it. Have you looked into any or done any research on you know injury proofing and, and injury prevention? I'm not really. Uh, that's not really my area. Yeah. So no. Yeah, just wondering. So it, it kind of sounds like too. You're describing a little bit of why it's so difficult to go back to this golf analogy. A golf comparison it's so difficult to change your golf swing or change your snatch position position yeah. or power clean so what i mean i grew up a golfer um i still play and i know how difficult still it is to change a golf swing what's that still a scratch <laughs> uh, Pretty much, yeah yes on, on a good day nice, nice. um so I know how difficult it is to change a, a minor position in your swing plane at the right. top to take away the, the, the tiny movement uh, for the first three feet, um, set everything up. And so even for the, the weekend golfer or the power lifter out there, you know, we saw Tiger Woods for years. He's changed his golf swing three or four times. What is happening? How, how difficult is it to change these motor ingrams throughout the body because it sounds like it's not just a, and I think this gets thrown out a lot and misused, a, um, just drew a blank, um, muscle memory. You know, it's not, I think this muscle memory thing is kind of a way misplaced. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're describing with the whole system, the CNS, the tissue, yeah. the muscles, it's a lot more difficult to change your golf swing or change your position in any sport for that matter. Yeah. Than people probably perceive. Yeah, because you have, you have neural adaptations as well, along the whole spectrum. So to really get into this deeply, you'd really need a, a motor control, motor learning neurologist, some, some in that spectrum. And, and it's a bit out of my field, so I'll, I'll just be brief on this one. But yeah, you've got those, the system working as, as a complete package. You, you can't just simply do one thing that has been ingrained so deeply. The nerves themselves are bigger. Right, so you continue to use a neural pathway, that neural pathway will, for lack of a better term, hypertrophy. And so now you spent 35 years hypertrophying something, and now you're gonna ask to change it in a week? Oh boy, I mean, that's just, that's just a lot you're asking. The angle of your joints, the way that they're used to firing, the way that they contract against the bone, the way the connective tissue is built, this is all ingrained over your decades. So yeah, it's very, very difficult. And this is why you're like, I'm changing position a little bit. I just feel really awkward here. I feel really tight here. Well, yeah, you were sort of built to move there. Mm -hmm. That two degree difference is a real big deal. And if you're deadlifting, yeah, two degrees is probably not super huge. When you're trying to do something that's really high neurologically in the skill, golf is a phenomenal example of that. Well, that two degrees means I'm 30 yards off after 20 yeah. yards. Mm -hmm. right, so that's a real problem. My snatch is the same thing. I don't have time to adjust on the fly. It's got to be in the right position or I'm missing. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think that's something Tiger understands because you'll hear him tell, I think the media yeah. maybe not get it and the fans, but he'll say, it's going to take me a year and a half till I play better golf because he knows I'm literally waking up every day at 5 a.m. to hit 1,000 golf balls. I'm waking up tomorrow at 5 a.m. to hit 1,000 yeah. golf balls to grain these new patterns. And it's it's a brutal change. Yeah, it is. It's very, very difficult. 
And then he's got other issues too to deal with, which are how do I make sure I have this new swing and not be in bad positions with my spine? And so he's trying to do two things. He's trying to change his swing and he's trying to actually change what muscles he uses, not for the different swing, but for his swing in general. So he's really making two massive changes, which are not a big deal for you and I. I could do that on an, on an individual round and it wouldn't be that big a deal. But when you're trying to be the best in the world, 10% is not even on the chart on the, on the tour anymore. Yeah. So yeah, that's the real problem. That's why, that's why you'll see his inconsistencies too, right? Like he'll shoot a great round and you're like, he's back, he's back. And then he'll throw up a 90. You're like, what the yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he, I promise you right now, if you just ask him, Hey, go shoot, uh, go shoot 75. He goes shoot 75 every day, but he's trying to shoot 70. Right. Right. So, or whatever, depending on the course it's on. Yeah. So he could shoot at 75 every day if he just relaxed and went out there. But he's trying to get that last little bit because he realizes 75 means I won't win. And I'm here to win. So that's why. Yeah, you got to go for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, to change gears a little bit, Andy, what's, what's some new training technology that you're playing with that you think shows some real promise? Man, what do we not have going? Uh, <laughs> we've got a bunch of different things. Probably most exciting – I've got a really cool grad student, uh, Peter Pham, uh, who's a power lifter. And he's a little guy, but he, he's really good relative to himself. And he's only been trained a couple of years. But Peter came up with this idea to basically take what uh, Louis is working on right now, Louis Simmons, which I think Louis is calling it his static dynamic something or other. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, phenomenal marketing term, Louis. Great. Um, but Peter was like, Hey, does this thing work? Because our lab has focused a lot on a phenomenon called post activation potentiation. Right. Okay. This is a physiological phenomenon that explains things like I picked up a really heavy barbell. I did a deadlift. I set it down and then all of a sudden I jumped higher. It is the equivalent of I'm where I'm the, the donut on the baseball bat right before I go up to swing, swing it with the donut feels heavy. Take the donut off. I feel fast. Okay. Well, what Louis is working on is what we are going to call preload because it makes more sense. And I think it makes it's clearer than your isometric I, I, dynamic mobilizer or whatever the hell is a terrible term he has for it. <laughs> um, but what he basically is, he has is he built this device where you can get into your deadlift position. You pull on the bar as hard as you possibly can. You pull, 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 and it doesn't move. You can pull with 5,000 pounds of force and it won't move. And then he flips a button and releases it. And then you can pull up and it goes boom and it flies up. Wow. So basically what we, we're calling a preload. So it's like you load, 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 load the bar. You flip a switch. The blocker comes off of it and then boom, you can pull the bar out. And so we built a device here that can do that. It's actually very, very simple. Something that once we get done, I could come back on here in six months or something and explain you exactly how to build it. It really just, we went to Home Depot. Wow. I mean, like it's not like anything, just, Co took a couple of uh, of um, of ratchets and stuff and put together a thing where it's like, okay, hold it here. You got to have a friend. Hit the button. It releases it. Use this stuff that you tie the your camper with. Like, it's just super. It wasn't that. It was super cheap, too. Very cool. But we're doing it on our force plate. So this is a, a piece of technology that's built into the ground that gives us exactly the force production down a bunch of bunches, digits, pounds, zero. And we could look at rate of force development, velocity, all these things. And so we're looking at that, trying to identify you know, hey, is there something going on there that we can, um, you know, is, first, is it working? And if so, why? And is this an effective thing that we can get going? And Louie actually got wind of it and sent a guy and he's like, hey, dude, we're going to send you a machine. Nice. <laughs> get it out there and, and see what we can do. And so we're going to take that. And then what we're actually going to do is, since I'm, um, I mean, like, I'm a, I'm a practitioner as well. Like, that stuff gets me really excited. But then I started thinking, well, what if, we could actually match that with some real muscle physiology stuff. Mm -hmm. so hopefully if this device works, then we can come back and we can take biopsies of the people's leg and say, we know it works, right? We know strength or force production went up 20%. But can we find a muscle physiology mechanism for why that 20% went up? And so we can take it to our other really cool piece of technology, which is my, my colleague and frequent collaborator, Jimmy Bagley He's up at San Francisco state. He's a real expert in muscle physiology as well, as well as in laser microscopes. And so we're building our own, it's called the laser confocal microscope. The one we're making is fluorescent. But basically this is where we can take the individual fiber. We put it underneath these lasers and we can scan it in three dimensions. And we can look at anything. We can tag it for those myonuclei, like I said earlier. 
So I can literally, I have these cool videos that are up and you can take them and you can just like, it's almost like Tony Stark. It's crazy. Yeah. Right? Where we're like, okay, spin it around. Let me see the other side of it. I want to look at it from the vertical side. Oh, why is that protein over here? It's down the left hand part of the cell. Let me spin it around there and things like that. So we're kind of trying to combine the training technology with this stuff. And, you know, because again, the idea is to say, well, okay, if it's making performance better, let's figure out why. And then maybe we can reverse engineer that back into performance and say, hey, do this thing because we know it's making this happen. And so you'll train better. Mm. And are some of those tests being done at, at very high loads, I would imagine? Oh, yeah. That's going to be at 100%. Yeah. So those will be like you pull at 100%, uh, and we'll get in some pretty high-level power lifters, uh, as well as normal people, normal strength trained folks and, and things. And, and we don't only study leads because we want to see what, what's, what a normal person can do. Right? And, and so we'll have a combination of those, and, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take it to the brink and see how heavy they can move and, and if it changes anything. What has your research told you on the post-activation potentiation and performance? So most of that has been from my colleague, Lee Brown. Uh, he's the real driver of the boat there. So he has looked at a bunch of different things. He's probably done 30 or 40 studies on this topic. He probably worked on them with 10 or 15 or 20 or so. But what we're looking at for the most part is the donut, the pre-activation stuff. It's very, very good. But the part people are missing is the other end of that spectrum. I've said this a hundred times and I'll, I'll say it again for forever. Speed is the most misunderstood and most underutilized training adaptation in all of the world. Like people do not understand speed training and they don't do it. And this is a great example of it. If you want to get better at putting, what do you go do? You go, you go putt. putt. Cool. You don't go putt with a heavier putter. Right? Like you go putt. If you want to get better at being fast, why do you put an extra load on your body and then try to move it fast? Well, that is good. Like I just told you, putting the donut on the back is helpful for training. But what's more helpful is improving the skill set. And this is what we call overspeed training. Okay. Uh, you guys ever done the, like you, you sprint on the track and you wear like a parachute right. or a bungee? That is, that's the equivalent of resistance, right? You're making the load heavier and more difficult. That's good. That should be a part of your program. But have you ever done it where somebody pulls you with the bungee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's over speed training. It's making you run faster than you're normally capable of. That's also important. In fact, some of our stuff has shown that's more effective than the resistance stuff. Really? In fact, with, with Dr. Brown, as I mentioned earlier, and specifically, he showed this with the baseball swing. He showed that when you take the donut on and you swing it, it actually does not make your bat swing any faster. It feels like it swings faster, and you think it, you perceive it to be faster, but you're not actually swinging any faster. I've heard that before about the, the donut and the bat. When you, when you pre-swing, though, with a wiffle ball bat, right, so it's a super, super light plastic bat, and you pick your bat up, you actually swing your bat faster now but it feels heavier. So my point here is resistance is obviously a critical part to all training adaptations, especially speed. But let's also acknowledge the other end of the spectrum is where let's make the load lighter than you. We have a harness where we can put onto people where we can lift you a little bit up in the air and so you can jump like 50 inches in the air. Let's make the, your load lighter and I want you to jump higher than you can. I want you to run down a slight hill, a tiny treadmill down and run over speed. Not so much that it changes your gait or it changes your swing, right? But I want you to feel like moving faster. So that's generally what we found is that the overspeed stuff is equal and in some cases even more important and more effective than the resistance. So we, we, you just, we need to train all ends of that spectrum. So we know that in order to be stronger, I have to pick something up that's heavier than me. That same thinking, that same logic says if I want to be faster, I have to move faster, not slower. That's interesting. I know we, we've talked with a guy who was a um, D1 strength and conditioning coach and he went on with the, with the Rams and had a long tenure there with those guys and whatnot. And he was really big and he was the first guy I had, he brought to my attention the post um, activation. And everything. Yeah. And what he would have these guys do, his guys would, they would squat and then they go and directly go do sprints. Sure. Box jumps right after he said, whatever you want to be better at, you yep. do directly after lifting. 
And so yep. me and Josh started implementing some of that. And it's, yeah. it's been great. You definitely tell a difference. But one thing I remember him saying was that he thinks eventually, and this kind of goes opposite of what you're saying, Andy, he thinks eventually you're going to see players, specifically in football, out there training with, like, weights on them, basically. Think, you know, um, uh, a weighted vest. Like a suit. Almost. Yeah, almost yeah. like a suit. So that way they become, you know, better at what they're actually, you know, doing. What's your thought there? Uh, you certainly could. I'm not saying it wouldn't be a part of your training program, but mm -hmm. that specific example is not one I would use often Right. for a barrage of reasons. So again, it doesn't go opposite to what, what I just said, because I would still say you should do some additional resistance stuff. That's clearly critically important. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily put a full load on them for a, a barrage of reasons. Yeah, Most of that would be slower. Well, that would be one of them. Yeah. And so you could use it for some training and some drills. In fact, there are some body suits available. I've had a couple mm -hmm. of companies reach out to me and even send me some product that where you can add. In fact, they have little sleeves on them where you can add or take it out as much as you want. So you can make it 1% more, 2%, 10% more. I do think there's merit there. I would agree fully, but I wouldn't think that that would be something you would put on every day for practice, for example, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, you need to understand sports specificity generally runs king. So what that means is you need to feel what it feels like to actually be on the field at your body weight. Right. While you're training. So he probably wasn't advocating this to be normally for all practice. Yeah. And if he wasn't, then I would say I agree with him. As something you could add on there, hey, why not? Cool. Be careful. Um, you don't want it to be so much you're changing position and you don't want to get a false sense. So a good example of that that I work with all the time is in a sport of MMA. So they box, they sprout, they spar, they practice all the time with big boxing gloves on. Well, what, what we found out is that's problematic for technique as well as for tactical mm. because you get a false sense of what you can block and you get a false sense of distance. And you get a false sense of fatigue when you have these 16 ounce gloves on. Then when you put your, your, your four ounce gloves on, that same blocking technique is not working anymore. I wouldn't have been able to tackle him here when I would have. Or I don't, I don't know, oh my gosh, now I'm so, so, so surprised when I get on the field and I see how fast these guys are moving. I'm not used to seeing things at that speed because I'm used to them being weighed down a little bit. Right. So I would just say it would be something that you wouldn't put on every single day. But as a part of, especially outside of, uh, far away from the season, I don't think there's any problem with doing that. Just wouldn't be advocating doing this as your normal training, like every day in practice with throwing a suit on. Right. That would be, a, I think, a problem. Now, flipping back to the preload principle, could someone apply that in the same way? Let's say they were going to go in and do five by five, a front squat, mm -hmm. and their rep scheme for that, or their weight for that was going to be 185. Could they, after a warm up, say, do one set of three at 205, then back that weight down? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If they're five by five. Would that be a, a simple way to implement that? Absolutely. And people have been doing that for decades. Like right. this is nothing new, but this is uh, a, a lot of people have been using that for forever. Pick your, pick your favorite strength and conditioning art, uh, author, Ripito, Poliquin, like even going back uh, to, to Hoffman and those guys, people, they've been doing that for a long time for sure. And not only do I think that, that you can do that, I would say that's a very good strategy often. Okay. And have you seen better results from the preload or kind of this post loading going in from, um, you know, squats into weighted jumps or sprints or what, what's kind of the comparison? If you I, can make one. I wouldn't say better is, a, is the appropriate term, but they do give you different. Okay, so a direct comparison between the two is often difficult. But what I will say is if you integrate both, you're probably going to be in a very good spot. So that's what I would say. Okay. And, uh, integrate them both. You know, and you can pick what I, here's what I would basically say, Josh, uh, the further away from your competition you are to probably do more of the extra load, the closer to competition, probably spend more time on the speed stuff. So the less load, so give yourself, and it, it, here's, here's a real question you're asking. What about, what's my goal of my training? Not only of, of my, like my performance goal I'm trying to get to, but what's my goal of this month, this week? today, this exercise today, this rep today, do I know what I'm trying to get out of all of them specifically? If you haven't identified that, you have no idea how to answer these questions. So if we say, okay, we are in a, a block where we're trying to drive adaptation 
okay, I may give you some disadvantages. I may actually ask you to do this thing tired. I may pre-fatigue you first because I want you to be able to develop power or be strong when you're tired, et cetera, et cetera. But I realize that's not going to give me optimal strength gains. I'm trying to drive adaptation here. I'm not trying to peak performance. Maybe as I get closer to season, I go, you know what? I want full rest and recovery. Sleep 12 hours. Get extra days off. I'm going to give you every advantage possible pre-workout. Now I want you to be boom as fast as you can. So what am I really driving? What's the point of this whole thing? Is it a strength thing? Is it a speed thing? Is it power? Am I trying to get better in the field? Is it an adaptation I'm trying to get? Is it, you know, so I might overwork you, underrest you, because I'm trying to drive physiological adaptation, or am I trying to peak for competition? Those are really the first questions you should be asking, and then you can answer these types of choice things about when you understand what's the goal we're trying to get to. Yeah, I love that. And that's something we ask ourselves every time we're writing a program, whether it's for us or anybody else, like, what's the purpose? What's the mm -hmm. purpose of, you know? Yeah, and go all the way down to each individual rep. What's the purpose of this individual rep? Right. And you have, if you have that identified, then these questions get a little bit easier. And did you have kind of in your mind, what would, what would be your ideal training for the everyday person that wants to get a little stronger, maybe wants to get a little bigger? Just... Mm -hmm almost just the everyday weekend warrior. Do yeah. you have uh, kind of something in mind for longevity and performance? Yeah, that's really, really good. I think you should move. I'm not in love with any particular training program or exercise or anything. I generally feel like if, you're, if that's the outcome goal, we should be touching a little bit of every end of our spectrum. I do think for normal people, you should do speed stuff. You should go, but maybe, maybe that's one exercise. Maybe that's a speed jump rope or it's a speed sprint on a bicycle, whatever you're comfortable with. Maybe it's throwing something as fast as you can. You should do something that's kind of heavy. You should do something that is heavy but gets you really tired. And then you should do something that's light that gets you really tired. And then you should do something that's very, very, very light and gets you really tired. Maybe it's 30, 45 minutes consecutive. If the outcome goal is health and overall performance over time, then we should probably play in that spectrum. So if you hit each one of those once a week, if you have a lot of variety in your exercise choices, and if you can do all that by keeping good position, then from there you can start to play. Hey, I've really found I, I like uh, split squats better. I'm going to add more of those in. But I really feel like every time I do this thing, I can't get in the right position so my shoulder hurts. Okay, that's out. I can't play tennis. That's bothering my elbow. Okay, that's out. Let me find a new mode. Actually, I like walking my dog for my – or two hours from my conditioning. Great, that's in. Hate running. Okay, running. And then now you can really start to tailor so that you are maximizing adherence, maximizing fun, but you're doing a little bit of everything. Something once a week should take you up to a heart rate max or, or ish. I mean, pick that. You want to do circuit training. You want to go for a run. You want to do hill sprints. You, I mean, you, you pick your poison, but get your heart rate up there. Cool. Do something that makes you sustain work for 30, 45 minutes. And do something that's really, really heavy. Maybe not super tired. Something that's really heavy. And then do something that makes you move fast. And then play. As many different of those as you possibly can. The last thing I'll add to that is also try to get a reasonable balance between your joints and the way they move. So my shoulder joint goes out in front of me, goes over my head, goes out to the side. So I should probably do something once a week that makes it go into all those positions. Maybe right. I can pick an exercise that has all those positions in it. If not, okay, I make sure I do a press, make sure I do a pull, make sure I do an overhead press and a pull, and you get it. And if you do one-ish every week, and maybe that's not every single week, that's just a lot to kind of build in. But the goal is to be like, oh, hey, man, it's been three weeks since I've done any leg, anything that requires my leg to extend. Let's find something that requires my leg to extend. And if you do that, I think that's a pretty good spot to be at for most people. Yeah, I love it. This is great this stuff. Been a bunch of great stuff, and we're we're gonna have to have you back on, man, because there's still so much that we could cover. But you got um, it, man, just name the time. Yeah, you're a busy man, but um, where what do you got going in the works right now? What's kind of on the horizon for you? So we have a lot of of projects. Um, I just launched my website, so that's okay. just my name, AndyGalpin.com, and what that is is it's essentially every lecture I've ever given for my classes, conferences. And I'm putting it all together up there and 100% free. No subscriptions, no up sales, nothing. Uh, those are five minute videos. So here's your answer in five minutes or less. It's called five minute physiology. 
I got a 25 minute version, so here's your answer plus a little bit of maybe about why it's working or things. And then I have 55 minute physiology, which is even somewhere is up to like three hours. Wow. Where I just unleash and I just go to the deep end. And I cover everything from here's what carbohydrates really are to here's how to write a program for a mixed martial artist to here's your physiology of fat loss. I mean, just kind of everywhere in between. So that's up. Um, and I'm just going to continue to build that and going. We're also exploring with some, some really new ideas for science. Yeah. So we have a thing up on a website called Experiment dot com forward slash muscle science and we what that is is it's effectively like kickstarter but for science and so what we're trying to do is say you know what number one most people don't want to most normal science funding agencies don't want to pay for this type of research we've been talking about they're paying for diabetes they're paying for obesity or or they're they're paying for the the treatment of acute disease and so what happens is there's just no money is at all set aside for sport performance or optimization. And so traditionally what that means is we have to then run to drug companies or supplement companies and, and get money from them to do research. But that comes with a bias. Uh, you, know who's gonna, you know who Gatorade's gonna pick to fund their studies? People that are doing carbohydrate and sport research. Mm -hmm. right, who's, gonna pick, who's gonna study powerlifting? No one's gonna, right, there's no supplement company that makes money off that. No pharmaceutical companies making money off of a drug. Like, there's just no money there. And so one of the things we said is like, you know what? We think this stuff is important. And we think people care about these answers. Maybe the people will pay for it. So we launched our first attempt at this. And what we want to do is, is actually that laser microscope I was telling you about. Well, we're building our own. And we need about $12,000 left to build our final piece. Because that microscope that we're using now is about 500 grand. Wow. And it just broke. Oh, and the university is like, we're not building another one. We're like, shit. <laughs> so all this stuff stops if we were like, you know what? Uh, my, my colleague, like I said, Jimmy Bagley is really smart. And he was kind of able to, we were able to scrape money away, like begging $500 from here and give me a hundred bucks to do this. And we were able to scrounge up enough money to build most of it. But now we need about, uh, like I said, about $12,000 more dollars. We can build this final piece and we'll continue to do it. So that's up right now, and that's just, again, experiment.com forward slash muscle science. That ends November 14th. So this is, a, this is just like Kickstarter where if we don't get fully funded, we get nothing. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with that is, number one, we don't get it, we get nothing, we don't do the study. But more importantly, the reason I have time to do things like this podcast, to give all that information away on my website, is because I don't have to spend time writing these grants to fund my research. Mm -hmm. the grant writing process guys like it takes a year wow and then i get back oh guess what you don't get funded mm -hmm. right because we're doing sports science and so honestly what you're really doing is you're buying my time so that i continue to do stuff like this which is free right? i don't take a penny to do podcasts i've never accepted money for these things i never will i'm not going to take a penny from my website so the reality of it is you're buying time for me to continue to do stuff like this for, so that i can continue to be active on instagram i give away all of my studies on there one thing that my lab does is when you publish research, the journals own it. And in order to read the paper, you have to be a member of that journal. Well, we pay a big fee to make sure that all of our papers are in what's called open access. So that it's free online with a click of a link for anyone in the world. We try to make sure our studies are not behind a paywall. But we have to pay that somehow. Right. Yeah. So that's what we have running right now. That's, that's the biggest thing. So we've got, like I said, November 14th is basically the last day we have to get it on there. Uh, we're really, really close. People are contributing. So we're happy to take any $5, any $10. And I'm very happy to take like $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. So, and yeah. After release this podcast, everybody, you got six days. So yeah. check it out. All the, all the links will be in the show notes. So there you go. Yeah. You can find it up. We've got it. I mean, it's, it's all over all of my social media stuff too. So you can see it everywhere. Um, we've had a bunch of people help us out too, from uh, Travis Mash to uh, NASA jumped on board. Um, their muscle physiologist jumped on board. He's really helping us a lot with it uh, because the, the specific study we're looking at is, is what we need to do to get to Mars. So like you guys heard that Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, right? Yeah. yeah. That's not a technology problem. <clears throat> the technology is not that difficult. That's a physiology problem. Can uh, the body 
sustain. We've got to be able to get the human body there and back. And what we're doing is trying to identify, we think we have a pretty good idea. Well, not pretty, like we for, almost for sure know the exact thing that controls whether your cells grow, shrink, or die. And if we can just do this last thing to get this microscope, we can do this study, and then we're going to really have a good grasp of why exactly those fibers are dying or growing or shrinking. So um, they're on board. we got a bunch of people. Uh, Stanford's on board. They're helping us out. I mean, we just got everyone on board, but they, they legally can only do so much. So we just need the people to you know, give me chip in 150, whatever you can do. Or like I said, if somebody – need some uh, it's getting to the end of the year if you need to get something off your taxes <laughs> you got 5k you want to dump and we could be done with this thing and it, as soon as the grant gets done if we get funded we get our money two days later we're starting wow this isn't like fund me to 2020 we'll have something out for you nope we will start november 17th if we if we get the money awesome. uh, yeah well andy thanks for joining us it's been a blast and again i think we probably only covered 10% of what we could have. Uh, <laughs> do it again. Cheers, man. It was awesome. Good times. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to the next one, guys.